I can't do this anymore, Amara told Sunday on the phone. She was pacing the floor of the mansion's guest bedroom, where she stayed when she could not stand being near Chief Okoro, her husband. He is getting better. What if he gets to live for years? Sunday tried to calm her down, but Amara was done pretending. I am going to divorce him, she said firmly. Tunde warned Amara that she might not be entitled to too much property if she divorces the chief that early. Why not wait for the old hag to die? I thought we agreed to this because we wanted the money badly. So what changed? You can't understand because you're not the one here. The old hag smells and looking at his old ugly face alone pisses me off. If you really need the money, I suggest you marry him yourself. Tunde warned her against taking the decision. But her mind was made up. The next morning, Amara marched into Chief Okoro's office and told him she wanted a divorce. The old man was devastated. He begged her to reconsider, his voice trembling with emotion as he tried to hold her hand. Please, Amara, he said. I know I am not what you dreamed of, but I love you so much. Don't leave me. The chief begged, but Amara was unmoved. I am sorry. She said coldly, pulling her hands away. I can't do this anymore, Amara said as she got up to leave. The divorce went through quickly. Amara felt a sense of relief as she packed her bags and left the mansion. But her relief was short-lived. Within this, she received a summon from Chief Okoro's lawyers, reminding her of the contract she had signed. She was obligated to donate her eyes to him as part of the divorce settlement. Amara opened her eyes wide in shock, disbelief written all over her face. She did not read the contract before she signed it. At first, Amara thought it was a bad joke. Surely, they couldn't enforce such a thing? She would say aloud as she paced from one end of her hotel room to the other. But as the days passed and the legal pressure mounted, she realized the gravity of the situation. The contract was ironclad, and if she refused, she would face severe legal consequences. Amara could not imagine losing her precious eyes, and she began to hatch a plan on how to flee the country, away from the chief, with Tunde, a boyfriend. As she laid on the bed, different thoughts ran through her mind. Amara could not believe the situation she found herself in because of her love for money. Amara had always been beautiful. She was born into a poor family in the heart of Lagos. She grew up in a neighborhood where she quickly learned that beauty could open doors that hard work could not, as young girls often end up selling their bodies to make money. Many times, her mother had wondered about relying too much on her beauty, but Amira paid no heed. She was determined to escape the circle of poverty, to rise above the dusty streets of her childhood, and to live the life she believed she deserved a life of luxury and wealth. It wasn't long before she became known for her charm, her ambition, and her cunning ways. She began to move with big girls who only date wealthy men, regardless of their age. It was here that she had the glimpse of the life she was always craved for, but she always wanted more. More money, more status, more power. And that was when she met Chief Okoro. Chief Okoro is a well-known blind business mogul in Lagos. He worked very hard to build his empire by investing in properties and investments that spanned across Nigeria. And he did everything to guard it jealously. But despite all his wealth, he was a lonely man. He had lost his wife in a tragic accident years ago, and it was the same accident that took his sight. Since then, he had lived a life of quiet isolation retreating from public life and surrounding himself with loyal staff. But he has been looking for ways to regain his sight, but no one was willing to donate their highs regardless of the price. There were rumors about the chief, whispers that he was sick, that he only had a few months to live, and that he was looking for someone to share his remaining days with. Amara did not care whether the rumors were true or not. What mattered to her was that Shifokoro was rich, and if the rumors of his failing health were true, she saw an opportunity to secure a future. It was Tunde, a long-time boyfriend, who first suggested the idea. Tunde was as ambitious as Amara, 
always looking for the next peace call. Babe, think about it. He had said one night as they sat together in their small dingy apartment. Marry the old man. He's blind, lonely, and desperate. Charm him, and when he dies, everything will be hers. At first, Hamara was hesitant. The thought of marrying a man old enough to be a father and a man who was blind and frail made a stomach turn. But Tunde was persuasive, painting a picture of a life of unimaginable wealth. Just think, Amara, when he's gone, we will be rich. You will never have to leave the finger again. All you have to do is play the part for a few months and bingo, we are rich. After days of trying to convince Amara without success, Tunde gave up. When Amara told Tunde that she needed a new trending iPhone and a bone straight wig, he asked her to rethink her decision about marrying the chief because he doesn't have such money I will not steal a phone for her. Amara had no choice but to give it a try. With that, the plan was set in motion. Amara made her way into Chief Okoro's life with his. Her beauty, youth and charm were irresistible to the lonely old man. She played the part of the doting wife-to-be perfectly. She listened to his stories, took walks with him around his mansion, and acted as though she truly cared about his well-being. Chifukuro, in turn, lavished her with gifts, jewelries, clothes, trips to exotic resorts, and shopping sprees. Hamara's world changed in a matter of weeks, and she wished she had considered the offer earlier. She would meet Nde from time to time, and tell him how much the chief loves her and shower her with gifts. Then she would also bring him gifts and money. Tunde was happy that her plan worked, and he thought Amara how best to exploit the chief without him suspecting anything. The chief was clearly in love, and the wedding was arranged in a few weeks' time. The wedding was the talk of the town, and it was attended by many dignitaries in Lagos. But beneath the surface, Amara was repulsed. As she stood beside Chifokoro, smiling and holding his hand, her mind was already racing ahead to the day when it would be gone and she would be free to claim all his fortune. A smile etched on her lips as the thought of how she would spend the money ran through her mind. She smiled broadly at the chief, who thought she was genuinely in love and happy to be with him. Tunde, locking in the background, gave her a knowing nod as the exchange vows. It was only a matter of time now. After the wedding, Amara moved into Chivokoro's beautiful mansion. It was everything she had dreamed of. Expensive furniture, artwork lining the walls, and staff on every floor to cater to her every need. But the price of a new life soon became clear. Even though Chifukoro was kind and generous, he was demanding. He needed constant care, and while he had staff to attend to, him. He always preferred Amara's company. She found herself having to spend time with him, taking long, slow walks through the garden, reading to him and sitting with him during his meals. The more time she spent with him, the more she despised him. She began to regret her decision, but whenever the thought of how much she stands again crossed her mind, she would smile. Her patience wore thin quickly, but soon they kept reminding her to stay focused. Just hold on, babe. He is old and sick. He can't last much longer. Six months stops and we are out of here. Amara tried to remain patient, counting the days until she could inherit everything and finally be free. But then, 18 months into the marriage, she discovered something that sent a chill down her spine. One evening, she sat in Chief Okoro's office pretending to organize some of his files when she stumbled across the chief's results that they dated months back. The test result shows that the chief was no longer dying and will be living a healthy life. Hamara was shocked as she stared at the results. Her hands shaking. Hamara's heart pounded as she reread the results, disbelief washing over her. Her hands shook as she called to inform Tunde. Tunde, always quick to dismiss her fears, laughed it off. Relax, babe. We'll find a way around it. But as the weeks passed, Amara grew increasingly anxious. She began to resent the old man even more. The way he clung to her, the way he insisted on her presence every evening. She couldn't stand all of it. Her dreams of luxury were now tainted by the terrifying thought of being trapped 
in a loveless marriage, unable to escape. Then, just as the 19th month of their marriage began, the chief informed her that his health had improved, and it's all thanks to her love and care. For this, he bought her a house and credited accounts with a large sum of money. Amara pretends to be happy even though she is furious. Before she married the chief, Tunde had promised her that she would only have to endure six months, but now it seemed like Chifokoro was not going anywhere. After claiming the property and doing all the paperwork, Amara informed Tunde about her plans. She wanted to leave the chief and start a new life in a far away town where no one knows them. The two agreed, unaware of the danger ahead. That night, as she sat on a chair reading the last letter from the court, tears streamed down Amara's beautiful face. She is faced with a tricky situation, whereby she has to choose between her eyes and the marriage. Amara could not bear to lose her precious eyes and the thought of going back to Chifukoro made her sick. Her heart rate increased and she began to sweat profusely, knowing that she cannot go with any of the options. That night, Amara quickly packed a few clothes in her traveling bag and she prepared to leave town. She wasn't even interested in the chief's money again. She simply wants to live a simple life. As she got out of her hotel room and waited for a ride, a black jeep pulled in her front and took her away. Amara fought hard as she found herself in the hospital. She pleaded with them not to remove her eyes, but no one listened to her. She was injected by the doctor and everything went dark. Amara had spent her whole life using her beauty to get ahead, and now, because of her greed, she was about to lose one of the most important things in the world, her sight. When she woke up from the surgery, the world around her was pitch black. Panic surged through her as she tried to open her eyes, but it was no use. They were gone. She was blind. Amara cried and wailed as she wished that she could turn back the ends of the clock, but it all seemed too late now. Soon they visited her in the hospital. We'll still have a good life, he promised, holding her hand. We'll figure this out, okay? But Amara could sense the shift in him. He no longer looked at her the same way. Without her ability to see, she had lost the very thing that had drawn him to her in the first place. Soon, his visits became less frequent, and within weeks, he was gone completely. Amara later found out that he had run off with another woman, taking all the money they had strictly stashed away during a marriage to Chief Okoro. Alone and blind, Amara was forced to move into a small dilapidated apartment in a poor part of the town. The life of luxury she had once dreamed of was now a distant memory, replaced by the harsh reality of her situation. She had nothing, no money, no signs, and no one to turn to. In her desperation, she reached out to Chief Okoro, hoping for some form of mercy. But when she called, it wasn't the chief who answered. It was his lawyer. The chief, he explained, had moved on and gotten married to someone who loves him genuinely. Amara was devastated and she cried and cried. Amara regretted her life decisions and she did everything to enlighten young girls not to rely solely on their looks to make money and do something tangible with their lives. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't subscribe before you leave and let me know what you think about this story in the comment section. Bye.